In this video, we're going to look at the CSEC Math June 2018 paper 2. So here we have our first question where we have question 1A. Using a calculator or otherwise, evaluate each of the following giving your answers to two decimal places. Now to say use your calculator or otherwise. So with these decimals here, I would use my calculator. But um, this would be bod mass because we have a subtraction, we have multiplication, and we know we have to work out multiplication first before we do the subtraction. So what this would look like would be this 73.18 take away, and I'll put in brackets, the 5.23 multiply 9.34 because we know we have to work out this first, get the answer, and then say this take away whatever answer we get here. All right, so here we have the calculator up. So we're going to put 5.23 multiply by 9.34 press equal. Now we're going to two decimal places. So what I'll do for the answers here is approximate them to three decimal places. And then the final answer, we'll do the two decimal places. So I have 48.84, I'll go to this eight. After this eight is a two, so I put in the 48.848. So I'll come here and put 73.18, take away 48.848. And now I can subtract these two. So I'll put the 73.18, take away the 48.848. And this answer, I'll write this to two decimal places. So I get 24.33 after the two. So there's three remain the same, so 24.33. So my answer, would be equal to 24.33. Now let's look at something. The calculator is actually smart enough to do bod mass on its own. So if you were to type this in exactly as it is, you would get this answer. So let's see. So if I were to type in 73.18, take away 5.23, multiply by 9.34 and press equal you see i get 24.3318 and the two decimal places that's just 24.33 after the threes are one so the three remain the same so okay same answer to two decimal places so here we have part two which is another bud mass question so you understand when we have something over something we need to work out the numerator first and if that's something to work out the denominator we work that out and then we divide them before we could proceed right so we have nothing to work out a denominator, but we have this um, 3.1 squared. And you know it bud mass, the B is for brackets, the O is for power of, and then you have the multiplication, division, and addition and subtraction. So basically powers come first before the four operations. So anyway, take it here, we got powers first, then do the four operations. So we will call for 3.1 squared first. All right, so we have 3.1, press the X squared button to square it. And we would get 9.61. So we have 9.61 divided by 6.17 plus 1.12. Now, as I said, we have to work out this division here first before we could add this uh, 1.12. And again, multiplication and division comes before addition and subtraction. So whenever you're working out stuff, you know, you do your multiplication and your division first, then you do your addition and subtraction. That's how bud mass works. Of course, brackets first, then powers then the multiplication and division, then addition and subtraction. So we're going to put that 9.61 divided by 6.17, press equal, and we would get, now we're writing this to two decimal places, so we want to write this to three decimal places, and then the final answer, two decimal places. So it's 1.557, after the 7 is a 5, so this would be 1.558. So I'm going to have 1.558 plus 1.12. But imply, imply. So now I'm going to say 1.558 plus 1.12. And press equal. We're going to get 2.678. So to two decimal places, that's 2.67. Then after 7 is a 8. 
So the sum goes up by 1 and turns to 2.68. So this would imply my answer is 2.68. So let's write an answer is equal to 2.68. So now part B of this question, we have Jenny works at Sammy's restaurant and is paid according to the rates in the following table. So we have Jenny's weekly wage agreement here. So she has a basic wage of $600. So she gains $600 no matter what once she shows up for the week. And then she gets 90 cents for each customer served. So we have a formula here. So in a week, Jenny serves N customers. So N is the number of customers. Her weekly wage is WJ. So, so WJ is Jenny's weekly wage in dollars as given by this formula. So we see the $600, which is constant because no matter how much customers she serves, she will always get a $600 a week. Now, this is the 90 cents per customer. So 90 cents multiplied by the number of customers will give her this um would give her this extra money. So now determine Jenny's weekly wage if she served 230 customers. So now remember N is the number of customers and this is the formula for Jenny's weekly wage. So all we have to do is replace this N with 230. So we put WJ for Jenny's weekly wage is 600 plus 0 0.90 times, so I'll just put in brackets, 230 customers, right? So again, we know we have to work out multiplication before we can do the addition. So you can multiply 90 cents or 0.9 by 230, get an answer and add it to 600. So WJ, Jenny's weekly wage is equal to 600 plus. So we'll have 0.9 multiply by 230 and we get 207. So that'll be 207. And of course, if we add 600 to 207, we simply get 807. Now this is in dollars. So I'll just write that over the dollar sign. All right, so dollars, 807.00. So here for part two of this question, we have in a good week, Jenny's wage is $1,000 or more. What is the least number of customers that Jenny must serve in order to have a good week? Now, let's examine the formula again for Jenny's weekly wage. All right, so Jenny's weekly wage was she gets $600 no matter what, and then 90 cents per customer. So what we want is that this 600 plus 90 cents per customer must be greater than or equal to 1,000, because our 1,000 or more means. So now what we'll do is put this 600 plus 0 0.90 times n must be greater than or equal to 1,000. All right, because this is her weekly wage, and we're saying that the weekly wage, in order for her to have a good week, must be $1,000 or more. So 1,000 or more. So now we're going to find the least number of customers that Jenny must serve in order to have a good week, which is you want to find the value of N for when this whole thing is greater than or equal to 1000. So a simple equation to solve, we put the 0.90N greater than or equal to 1000. And of course, we're going to transfer this positive 600 across the inequality sign and the sign in front of it is positive. Now let's just do a little animation for that. All right, so I have back the same line as I have on top here. So what we're going to do is take this positive 600 and we transfer it across the inequality sign. As we transfer it across, it's going to turn from positive to negative. And now it comes on this side here. So we have a 1,000 take away 600. Now, because the 0 0.9 has um, nothing here, we don't need to write the positive sign in front of it. So that's how we end up with 0.90n is greater than or equal to 1000 take away 600, which is 400. So we're going to get 0.90n is greater than or equal to 400. So now the operation between 0.9, because this is 0.9, and n is multiplication. So when we transfer this 0.9 across the inequality sign, the operation is going to change to the opposite of multiplication, which is division. All right, so I just wrote back the line exactly like how I have it here, because I'm going to do some animation here. So, so when this moves or is transferred across, the operation is changed from multiplication to division, so it will go under the 400. 
So you get 400 divided by 0 0.90. So now we'll have n is greater than or equal to, and of course we'll take the calculator and say it's 400 divided by 0 0.9, because 0 0.90 is just 0.9, and that is equal to 444.4. So I write that down. Well, the four is reoccurring, right? Four, 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 four. So that's four hundred and forty-four point four reoccurring. Now, listen to what I say. Well, we can't have, we can't have a fraction of a customer. So we want the least number of customers for Jenny to have a good week. So if we have four hundred and forty-four customers, we'll end up with less than a thousand dollars. Four hundred and forty-four point four would give us the one thousand dollars. So therefore, the least number of customers to make 1,000 or more has to be 445 customers. So now I'll put the least number of customers for Jenny to have a good week is 445 customers. So here we have for part three that at the same restaurant, Shona is paid a weekly wage of $270. So no matter how much customers she serves, she's always going to get $270 plus $1.50 for each customer she serves. So W, the small s, is going to be representative of Shona's weekly wage. All right, so they want us to write a formula calculating Shona's weekly wage. Now that's easy to do if you just look back at what we did for Jenny. All right, so let's look back here. Uh, Jenny's weekly wage. She earns $600 no matter how much customers she served. That's why you have 600 here. Plus 90 cents for each customer and N was the number of customers. So 90 cents times the number of customers. So now if you look at Shona, we just follow the same pattern. All right. So she earns $270 no matter how much customers she serves. So WS is 270 so far plus, all right. $1.50 for each customer. So if N, well, hold on. We say that the number of customers she serves, calculating Shona's weekly wage when she serves M customers. So for Shona, the number of customers is M and not N. All right. So that'll be M, the number of customers, times the amount of money she gain per customer. So that's $1.50 times M or 1.5 times M. I'll put it the same way they have it because for Jenny was 90 cents and I put 0 0.90. So for here, we'll put the $1.50 like this times M. And this will be a formula for Shona's weekly wage. Now here we have in a certain week, Jenny and Shona received the same wage for serving the same number of customers. How many customers did they each serve? Now listen to this. Remember Jenny was um, N, the number of customers was N, and Shona, the number of customers is M. But if they serve the same number of customers, then N is equal to M. I was going to put serving the same number of customers. All right, would imply that M is equal to N. All right, so we could use the symbol M. In this case, for this question, we could use M or N, all right, because it's the same number of customers. Now, they're saying that Jenny and Shona received the same wage. So what that means is the weekly wage for Jenny is equal to the same weekly wage for Shona. Now, remember, Jenny was 600 plus the 90 cents times N. And we have a Shona is 270 plus the $1.50 times M. And we're saying that since the number of customers are the same, then this M is equal to this N. So you can use any symbol you want. If you want to replace this M with the N or this N with the M, it's all good. So what I'll do at this, um, stick to the N and replace the M here with N. So we have 600 plus 0 0.90 N is equal to 270 plus $1.50 times N because both of them serve in the same number of customers. So N is the number of customers. So now this is just a simple equation to solve to find the value of N, which is how many customers did they each serve? So I'm just going to write over this line on top here. So we have 600 plus 90 cents times N is equal to 270 plus 150 
times n. So now what we want to do is bring the terms with n together, that's these two, the 150 n and the 0 0.90 n, and then these constants, the 600 and the 270 together on one side of the equal sign. So on one side, we're going to have the terms with n, and the other side of the equal sign, we're going to have the constant 600 and 270. So if you want, you could leave this um, 0 0.9 here with the n and bring this 150 across. So we're going to transfer this positive 150 n across. And as we're going across the equal sign, the opposite of addition is subtraction. So this addition sign will turn to a subtraction sign. And now we can put it anywhere we want. Okay, so what I'll do, I'll just move this back a bit. I'll move the equal sign here. And I'll trans let's shift these up a little bit here. And I'll bring this right here. So now I have the n's together like that. Now, what I want to do now is bring this 600, transfer it across the equal sign to bring it by this 270. So when I take this, this is positive 600. It's coming across. And as it crosses the equal sign, it becomes negative 600. Opposite of addition. So now I just have to make some space for this. So let me bring this across. And we have the negative 600 here. Now, because there's nothing in front of the 0 0.9, I remove the positive sign because it's understood to be there. So now we have to work out 0 0.9, take away 1.5. So we can work that on the calculator. So I'll have 0 0.9, take away 1.5, which is dollar and 50 cents, and we get uh, negative 0 0.6. So I'm coming here and writing negative 0 0.6 n and of course we're going to take away 270 from 600 so now we're going to get 270 take away 600 and that will be equal to negative 330 so that's negative 330 so now what we have to do is take this negative 0.6 and transfer it across the equal sign and the operation between the negative 0.6 and the n is multiplication. So when you transfer it across, the operation will change the division. So what we have is n is equal to negative 330 divided by negative 0 0.6. Of course, you're dividing two negatives, you're going to get a positive. So we're going to calculate and work it out. So n is equal to, we'll have the negative, so I'll put negative 330 divided by negative 0.6 and we get 550. All right, so that's 550 customers. All right, so let's put they must each serve 550 customers. Now moving on to question two, we have factorized completely each of the following expressions. So we have, um, first one, we have this. We look at it carefully, we have one take away four eight squared. Now factorization, we're looking to see if there's anything common between the two terms and I have nothing common between the two terms. So what do I do? Well, I recognize that this one is one squared and this four is two squared. So watch this. This one could be represented as one squared and the four could be represented as two squared. I put back the eight squared. So this would mean one squared take away two h in brackets squared. So what we have here is the difference are two square numbers, right? Because h is a symbol to represent some number that we don't know, right? So it's a square number. All right, so this will be difference of two squares. And if you remember our difference of two squares formula, when you're factorizing, you know, one bracket is plus, one bracket is negative, and we're using one and two h. So we have one plus two h, and one take away two h. And that's the answer. All right, so moving on to part two of this question now, we have uh, pq then take away q squared, then take away 3p plus 3q. Now, if you look at all four terms, the terms are separated by plus or minus signs. So one, two, three, four, four terms. Is there anything common to all four? I'm looking here, q, q, no q, p, no p. All right, three, three, no, no threes here. So nothing common to all four. So this would be a factorization by grouping. So what I'll do is I'll look at the first two terms. All right. And I'll say, what's common between these two? And of course, that'll be Q, right? So Q is my highest common factor. Open brackets. Divide PQ by Q. So the Qs will cancel. 
and p remains and divide q squared with q and of course i'll get q to the power one here when i divide those two so that's just q then i'll look at the next two terms so that'll be negative 3p with positive 3q now because my first term in my factorization here with these two is a negative um, number i will put my hcf my highest common factor as negative all right so looking what's common between these two and that's what that'll be three because in three here three here come on so three open brackets divide negative 3p by negative 3 and we get positive p divide positive 3q by negative 3 so you divide a positive and a negative you're going to get a negative answer 3 cancel 3 and remove q so now you're seeing that your two brackets are the same that must always happen for factorization by grouping so now you take what's outside the q and the negative 3 and put that in brackets so we have q take away 3 and then take the p take away q and put that in brackets and that's the answer so now we have for part b we have solved each of the following equations so we have an equation here so we have 3 over 2y is equal to 12. now i can do this in several ways um we could cross multiply we could um, divide both sides by 3 over 2 so however i want to do it okay but uh, if you cross multiply we recognize that um this 3 over 2y means 3 over 2 multiplied by y over 1 that what it means right is equal to 12. And if you multiply across, you get 3 by y is 3y, and 2 by 1 is 2. Now we can put 12 over 1. All right, and then we can cross multiply. So 3y by 1 is just 3y. And then the 2 by 12 is 24. So now we transfer the 3 across the equal sign. The operation between 3 and y is multiplication. So when we transfer it across, the operation changes to division. So we're going to get y is equal to 24 divided by 3. And of course, 24 divided by 3 is 8. All right, so next up, we have this quadratic equation. So the easiest thing to do here is use the quadratic formula because it is on the formula sheet. So let's use it easy i mean you could factorize and solve it but that's easier to just use the quadratic formula so you know the number in front of x squared is a so a is equal to 2 the number in front of x is b so b is equal to 5 and the, number, and the constant here is negative 3 so that'll be c so c is equal to negative 3. all right so you know the formula is x would be equal to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared, and I set it on the formula sheet. Take away 4ac all over 2a. So I'm going to replace the b with 5, so negative, and b is 5, plus or minus the square root of b squared, and again, b is 5. Take away 4 times a, and a is 2, times c, and c is negative 3, all over 2 times a, and a again is 2. So now, of course, negative by 5 is negative 5. So we get negative 5 here, plus or minus, square root of. And what I like to do is just work this whole thing out, but I'll do it in parts. Um, 5 squared is 25. And then you're going to multiply this negative 4 by 2 by negative 3. So if you're not comfortable with that, you can do it on the calculator. All right, so you can multiply negative 4. So watch, negative 4, multiply by 2. All right, multiply by negative 3. Press equal, and you see a positive 24. So what I'm going to do here is write positive 24 over 2 by 2, which is 4. Now, 25 plus 24 is 49. All right, so we're going to get x is equal to negative 5 plus or minus the square root of 49 over 4. So this would be x is equal to the square root of 49, 7. So 5 plus or minus 7 over 4. So now this is how we're going to get our two answers. So we're going to have either x is equal to negative 5 plus 7 over 4, or we're going to have x is equal to negative 5 take away 7 over 4. 
I play two answers here, so I'm going to put either. All right, x is equal to negative 5 plus 7 over 4. And negative 5 plus 7 is positive 2. So that's positive 2 over 4, which is a half. Or we're going to have x is equal to negative 5, take away 7 over 4. All right, so that's why you use the plus or minus, right? One is plus, and then the other one is negative. Okay, so here you have to add and keep the negative signs, and that will get negative 12. So negative 12 over 4. Of course, negative 12 divided by 4 is negative 3. And those are your answers, right? So answer x is equal to a half, or x is equal to negative 3. All right, so moving on to part C, we have the quantities F, M, U, V, and T are related according to the formula of this. So you say find the value of F, which is here. So F is already subject of the formula. And they give you the values for M, U, V, and T. So you're just going to put those values into the formula. So this is a substitution. So we're going to put F is equal to, and I'm going to write over the formula. So we have M first, M is 3. Open brackets, then you have V, what is V? V is 2. Then we have take away u. And what is u? u is negative 1. So we have take away from the formula. And then u itself is negative 1. All right. Then we're going to divide by t. And t is 1. Now, bod mass, we have brackets first, right? So here we have the brackets. So we have to multiply these two negative signs first. They got positive signs. So f is equal to 3. Open brackets 2. Multiply these two. Get positive signs. So 2 plus 1 over 1. Now, brackets first, so add the 2 and the 1 and get 3. So 3 by 3, right? Got 2 plus 1 is 3, over 1. And 3 by 3, that would just mean, right? Brackets mean multiply, say, multiplying this by what in this, this m here, multiplying this m by what's in the brackets. And what's in the brackets works out to be 3, so 3 by 3, 9. Over 1, and of course, 9 over 1 is just 9. So now for part two, they want us to make V the subject of the formula. Now, right now, F is the subject of the formula because F is by itself on one side of the equal sign. So the equal sign are two sides, right? This is the left-hand side and this is the right-hand side. It doesn't matter which side something on. Once it's by itself, it's the subject of the formula. So I'm going to write over the formula. F is equal to M, open brackets, V, take away U, over T, uh, the method I'll use here is cross multiplication because we want, let me shade what we want. All right, we're going to make this V the subject of the formula. So this is what we're looking for, this V. So what I'll do is I'll cross multiply. So I'll put the F over 1. And put the M times the V take away U over T. Now, as easy a method, if you could see it, is to multiply both sides by T. So F by T is FT. And when I multiply this side by t, the t's will cancel, and I guess get this m times v take away u. That's the same thing I'm going to get here when I cross multiply anyway. But it will be shorter to just multiply both sides by t rather than cross multiplying. All right, so f by t, as I said, will be ft. And this 1 times m times v take away u. Now, 1 times anything, we just get back the same thing. So let's get back m times v take away u. All right. Now, what I'll have to do is, well, there are two ways you could do this. We could expand, all right, or I could simply say, you know what, this m is being multiplied by this. So if I move this or transfer this m across on this side, the operation will change from multiplication to division. So it'd be ft divided by m. So what I'm going to get is ft divided by m is equal to v take away u. So as I, as I see, this m, this brackets here means m is multiplying by the thing in brackets. So I transfer it across the opposite of multiplication is division. So it will be this divided by the m. All right, so we have this. So now we have the v take away u. Now remember, it's the v that we want. Okay, we want this v. So what we had to do, we had to transfer this negative u across the equal sign. And of course, the sign in front of it is negative. So when we transfer it across, the sign in front of it will change to positive. 
So what I'm going to get is ft over m. I'll just write it out like this again. So what we'll do, we'll take this negative u, and as we translate across the equal sign, as it crosses, the sign will change from negative to positive. And what I'll do, I'll move this ft over m back here and put the positive u right here. And this would be your answer. V is now the subject of the formula. So you have transpose for V or make V the subject of the formula. Now you'll get full marks writing it like this. But if you want, I'll just put this in red. You can write it the other way around where you put the V first and then you put the FT over M plus U. So in this question, question three, we have using a ruler, a pencil and a PF compass, construct triangle ABC such that AB is eight centimeters. So this will be the first thing we're gonna do. Construct this line segment eight centimeters long. Then we have angle BAC is 30 degrees. So the angle at A is 30 degrees. And then we have this line segment AC is 10 centimeters. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take my ruler and I'm gonna make a light line, of course, more than eight centimeters long because we are constructing the line segment AB, which is eight centimeters. So I'm just gonna make a light line here, more than eight centimeters long. Then I'm gonna take my compass, place it at the zero on the ruler, and I'm gonna open this compass out to eight centimeters. Then I'm gonna place my compass point at any point on that light line that I just made. And I'm gonna make an arc like this. Then I'm going to take the compass point and place it where I made that arc, where that arc intersects the line that I just drew. And I'm going to make a next arc like this. And in between those two arcs would be my line segment AB. So I could put my labels A here and B. So now that I have my line segment AB, after constructing the angle BAC, so as I said, the angle is at the letter in the middle, so the angle is at A. So at A here, we are constructing 30 degrees. So I'm going to take my compass. I can open it out to any length that I'm comfortable with. So I'll just make it a little smaller here. And I'm going to take compass point, place it at A. And I'm going to make an arc like this. And where the arc intersects the line here, I'm going to place the compass point. And I'm going to make another arc like this. And if I draw a line from A through where these two arcs intersect, that will be my 60 degree angle. So now that we have this 60 degree angle, we have to bisect it to get 30 degrees. So seeing that I already have the compass here and I have this arc here, because to bisect an angle, you have to make an arc to cut the both arms at the angle. So to see this arc cutting both arms of the 60 degree angle here and here. So you have to place the compass point at this point, make an arc and place the compass point at this next point here where this um, arc intersects the arm and make an next arc. So we already had a compass point here. So let's just continue with this arc and bring it down like this. And then I'm gonna take the compass point and place it here. and make an arc like this. And now we'll have our 30 degrees coming through here straight to A. So this would be my 30 degree angle here. All right, so we're ignoring this line. We're looking at this line, this is our 30 degree angle. Now remember all these things are drawn lightly. When we have the final outline, the final shape, then we'll darken it. So now the last piece of information is to construct the line segment AC, which is 10 centimeters. Now we're saying the line segment is AC. So this is A, and remember this is a 30 degree line here. So A to C, which is somewhere along this line. So we're going to measure 10 centimeters from A along this line to get where C would be. And that would be a line segment AC. So again, I'll get my ruler. I'll take my compass, place it at zero on the ruler and I'll open it out to 10 centimeters.
Then I'm going to take my compass, place it at A, place the compass point at A, and I'm going to make an arc to cut this line that's for 30 degrees. And now this point here where this arc and this line intersect would be our point C. So now what I could do is connect the point C here to B. So I'll take a line from C and connect it to B. And once I'm happy with my shape triangle A, B, C, I could just darken this final outline and that will be my answer. And there you have it, triangle A, B, C. So now for question three, part B, we have the diagram below shows the triangle OPQ. So we have this triangle here, OPQ. And for the first part of the question, they want us to state the coordinates of the point Q. So we locate the point Q here, and we can just read off the coordinates, you know, X first, then Y. So this is the X axis, horizontal, and the Y axis, vertical. So we've seen four on the X axis. And if we look here, and um, we've seen zero here, and then two. So in between could be one. So this could be one. So one on the Y with four on the X. I'll just put the one in red here so that we can see that this is one. All right, so I'll just put Q coordinates, four on the X, one on the Y. All right, so now we have part two of this question where the line PQ is mapped to P prime Q prime by an enlargement with the center as O and the scale factor of three. So this O here is the center of enlargement. We have a scale factor of three. So say on the diagram above, well, it'll be this diagram. I just have this in the wrong place. This is supposed to be below here. All right, so on the diagram above, that's this diagram here. Draw the line P prime, Q prime. All right, so this is the line PQ here, and this is what we're gonna perform the enlargement with a scale factor of three, with the center of enlargement being the origin here. So I'm just gonna drop this below here. So now if you know you do enlargement, we need some lines coming from O and passing through P and also Q. So from O passing through P, we have this line here. And from O passing through Q, we have this line here. So now to do a scale factor of three, I will get my compass. I'm going to start with anyone. So if I go to Q first, so from O, place my compass point at O, Gonna bring this line up with the Q. All right, and let my compass open it out a distance with Q. I think that's good there. Yeah? So that'll be a skill factor one. Then I place the compass point at Q. And I make an arc like this. And that'll be a skill factor two. Place the compass point here where the arc cuts the line. And now this will be a skill factor three when I make this arc here. I'm going to do the same thing, place the compass point at O here. And I'm going to open this up to line up a distance for P. All right, so this will be a scale factor of one. Place the compass point at P here. Make an arc, this will be a scale factor of two. Place the compass point where that arc cuts the line. And this will be a scale factor of three. I'm going to make this arc here. So now all I have to do now is connect this here, because this will be scale factor three for this line, and then connect it to this point here, which will be scale factor three for the line with Q. So I'm making my line here, like this. And now this would be P prime, and this would be Q prime. So this is P prime, and this here is Q prime. All right, so the line PQ is mapped to P prime Q prime by an enlargement, center O, origin, and scale factor of three. On the diagram above, draw the line P prime Q prime. So we did that. Now for part three of the question, we have the triangle OPQ. So that's this triangle again. Undergoes a reflection in the line Y equals zero. So let's just stop here. What is the line Y equals zero? Well, if this is the y-axis, where's zero on the y-axis? Zero will be right here. And let's say I wanted the line y is equal to six. Six is here on the y-axis, and you draw a horizontal line passing through six. And that'll be the line y equals six. Therefore, if you want the line y equals zero, that'll be here and going horizontally passing through zero, which would just be the x-axis. 
So the line y equals zero is just the x-axis. So you want to do this reflection in the x-axis to produce the image O double prime, P double prime, Q double prime on the diagram. Well, let's say above, this was supposed to be below, right? So this diagram we're talking about here. So draw the triangle O double prime, P double prime, and Q double prime. So we're going to perform the reflection of this in this x-axis right here. So you know the um, concept of reflection, the line connecting the object and the image must be at right angles to the mirror line, and the mirror line is going to be the x-axis. And of course, the distance between the object and the mirror line must be the same as the image and the mirror line. So Q here is one block away from the mirror line. Therefore, the image of Q will be one block on this side away from the mirror line. So this would be Q double prime. Same thing here, we have P, we have one, two blocks away from the mirror line. So the image will be two blocks on this side, one, two. And this here will be our P double prime. Now if we look at O, it's on the mirror line. Therefore, the distance away from the mirror line is zero. Therefore, the image would have zero distance away from the mirror line as well. So O double prime is the same as O. Then my triangle will come from O here to P double prime, and then from P double prime to Q double prime, and then from Q double prime back to O, which is O double prime as well. And this is my triangle, this is my reflection. Now moving on to question four, we have question four part A. We have the function f with domain A, one, two, three. So that means x is one, x is two, and x is three is given by this function here, f of x is equal to a half x take away three. What is the value of f of one? So this is very simple. We have f of x is equal to a half x take away three. So notice you have x here and x here, and they want to find f of one. So replacing this x with one. And therefore, if you replace that x with one, you have to replace this x here with one also. So a half times one take away three. A half times one is just a half. Take away three. If you're not sure, you can work this out on the calculator, but a half take away three would just give you, well, three is the bigger one, right? So the sign in front is negative. So you're going to get a negative answer. So it's going to be negative two and a half. So negative two and a half. All right. And if you're not comfortable with fractions, you can type into the calculator. So one over two. And then we're going to take away 3. And I see you have negative 5 over 2. If I convert that, see I get negative 2 and a half. All right, so now for part 2 of this question, we have find the value of x for which f of x is equal to negative 2. So if this is f of x, and you're saying f of x is equal to negative 2, so f of x is equal to half x, take away 3, and also f of x is equal to negative 2, then that could only mean that a half x take away 3, which is f of x, is equal to negative 2, which is also f of x. And now this is your equation to solve. So carrying the negative 3 across, well, transferring across the equal sign first, everything from negative 3 to positive 3. So a half x is equal to negative 2 plus 3. So a half x is equal to, you get a positive 1 here. Then we have to transfer the half across the equal sign. Now, because the half has been multiplied by the x when you transfer it across, the operation is going to turn to division. So normally I just put it under. But since it's a fraction, I'm going to write it like this. x is equal to 1, and remember the half is going across, and the operation is changing to division. Opposite of multiplication, so divided by a half. All right, so now if you divide by a half, you know the rules. Change the divide to multiply and invert. So if I invert this, I'm going to get 2 over 1 which is just two. So that's just one multiplied by two. So X is equal to two. All right, so moving on to 4A part three, we have an ordered pair for the function is expressed in the form AB. Using your answers to A part one and A part two, or otherwise list the ordered pairs for the function F. Now, 
they have the ordered pair A, B. So this is like a coordinate. That's the ordered pair. So the first component is the X component. So A is the X component and B is the Y component. Now, you see how they give you the domain here as one, two, three? It means the X component is going to be one for one. Well, you have three ordered pairs, right? So the first one, the X component is going to be one. The second one, the X component is going to be two. And the third one, the X component is going to be three. Now, how do you get the Y component? Well, if you find F of one, you'll get a Y component for this. If you find F of two, you'll get a Y component for this. And if you find F of three, you'll get a Y component. Now, if you look back at the first question, we found what was F of one. So we got to F of one is equal to negative two and a half. So that would mean that one is mapped to negative two and a half on a mapping diagram. Or I could express that as an ordered pair as one as the X component and negative two and a half as your Y component. So again, that from the first one. Now, when you look at part two, we have F of X is equal to negative two. Now the value of X was two. So that means F of two, let me write that out. So this would mean F of two is equal to negative two because this is F of X. So you replace the X with two and the result is going to be negative two. So F of two is negative two, which means this two in the domain is mapped to negative two in the range. So this X value is mapped to the negative two as your Y value. So that would mean that two is mapped to negative two. And as an ordered pair, you have two as the X component and negative two as a Y component. So you're saying you already have two answers here. One is mapped to negative two and a half, and then you have two is mapped to negative two. So I could go and write those out. So I'm just going to put set of ordered pairs is equal to set bracket. So I'm going to have one was mapped to negative two and a half. And then the other one we have two was mapped to negative two. And again, we got that from here. One mapped to negative two and a half and two mapped to negative two. So the only one missing is what is the ordered pair for three? So we have to work this one out. So I'm going to come here and say, okay, f of x is equal to a half x take away three. So we want to find out what's f of three. So as a half times, I replace the x here with three. So doing the same thing on this side, replace the x with three, take away three. Now a half times three, that's a half times three over one, which is three over two. So that's three over two, take away three. Now I can use a calculator and work that out, but this is just one and a half, take away three. So if you want, you can work that out like this. All right, LCM is two, two into two, one, one by three is three. Take away one to two is two, two by three is six. Three take away six is negative three. So you get negative three over two, which is negative one and a half. So I'm just gonna put negative one and a half. Likewise, we could put three over two like that and take away three. And we see we get negative three over two. And if we convert that, that's negative one and a half. So now we know that this X value is mapped to this Y value. So for ordered pair here, we're going to have three is mapped to negative one and a half. Close my set brackets. And now this is my set of ordered pairs here. Now I know they didn't say set of ordered pairs, they just say list all the ordered pairs, but still I put it as a set of ordered pairs. Now for part four, they say explain why f of x is not equal to five for the function specified. So now I just brought back this information from the other page, which is what we worked out, the set of ordered pairs. All right, so this is all our work in here. Now notice our domain is just one, two, and three. That's our domain, nothing more, nothing less. And our range would be the y values. So the x values are members of the domain. All right, so this is a X value, this is a X value, this is a X value. So that's your domain here, A. I remember the range is here, here, and here. Now notice, this is your range, nothing more, nothing less. This value five is a member of the range. 
but are you seeing five here? No. That's why f of x cannot be equal to five because five is not a member of the range. So a simple explanation, you already have um, this information here already. So what you could do is state that the domain, because this is from your previous work. All right, so my domain, which is a, all right, was the set one, two, three, and my range, Right for that domain was negative two and a half, negative two, and negative one and a half. So now you, you do have to put all this over, right? I just put this back on this page so that um you can see what's going on, right? So this is my explanation here. The explanation start here. Domain is this, range is this. All right. Actually, you didn't even have to state the domain, okay? Domain already stated here. So all you have to do is already state the range. This is your range. And all you have to say is now, since five is not a member of the range, f of x is not equal to five. So everything easier to see here now. So my explanation, this is my domain, this is my range. Since five is not a member of the range, f of x cannot be equal to five. Because your domain is here, and out here, the number out here is your range, and the number inside here where x is, is your domain. So this five is a member of the range, but it does not exist inside of here. So now for part b, we have to solve some inequalities. So this is our first one here. Now easy stuff. We'll just uh, transfer the negative one across the inequality sign. I will turn to positive one. So now elm plus one is 12. And now we're trying to transfer positive three across the inequality sign. The operation will change from multiplication because three multiplied by x to division. So now we're going to have x is less than 12 divided by three. So x is less than and 12 divided by three is four. Now part B, we have this next inequality, two is less than or equal to three X take away one. So what I'll do, I'll transfer the negative one across on this side, I'll turn to positive one. So I'll have two plus one is less than or equal to three X, two plus one is three, which is less than or equal to three X. And when I transfer this three across on this side, the operation, see three multiplied by X, will change from multiplication to division. So I'll have this three divided by this three. So three divided by three is less than or equal to X. So this is one is less than or equal to X. So this is really saying that X is more than or equal to one. So I can write it like this, X is more than or equal to one. So that's my answer. Now part two, we have to represent the solution of two less than or equal to three X take away one less than 11 on the number line shown below. Now I might be thinking, hey, I'm gonna work out this but if you look above, you're seeing 3x take away 1. Look here, 3x take away 1, 3x take away 1, same thing, right? And now we're seeing here, 3x take away 1 is more than or equal to 2. We have 3x take away 1 is more than or equal to 2. And I've got to say now, 3x take away 1 is less than 11. 3x take away 1 is less than 11. So I'm just going to write that out here. So once you have 2, less than or equal to 3x take away 1, which is less than 11, all right? This would mean that um, 2 is less than or equal to 3x take away 1, and 3x take away 1 is less than 11. Now, the answer to this is what we will call here. Seen it here? So you get x is more than or equal to 1. So the answer here is x is more than or equal to one. And this part here is what we will call it here. And the answer to this was x is less than four. So the answer for this is x is less than four. So when it comes to the number line, you're coming here now to put x is more than or equal to one, which is here, and x is less than four. So you're going to come by the one and put a shaded circle because you have X is more than or equal to one. So shaded circle on the one 
and now the x is less than 4, we're going to have an unshaded circle on the 4. So unshaded circle on the 4. Now we're going to put a line connecting them. And we're going to have an arrow going this way to represent more than or equal to 1. And an arrow going this way to represent the less than 4. All right, so a shaded circle means equal to 1 and going this way, which is more than 1. Equal to 1 with the shaded circle. And unshaded means it's not equal to 4, but this arrow going this way means it's less than 4. Okay, and that's your solution represented on the number line. So here we have question 5, part A, where we have students in a group who ask to name their favorite sports. Their responses are shown on the pie chart below. So the favorite sports are football, cricket, and tennis. And here we have the angles on the pie chart. Now they wanted to calculate the value of x. Now x is an angle and a full revolution is 360 degrees. So what we'll do to get x is add up the 94 and the 45 and we'll take it away from 360 to get x. So we'll have x is equal to 360 degrees take away 94 degrees plus 45 degrees. So if we go on our calculator, we could type that in. So we could put 360, take away open brackets, 94 plus 45, close brackets, press equal, and that's 221 degrees. So X is equal to 221 degrees. Now for part two, they ask, what percentage of students chose cricket? Now, cricket is 94 degrees out of 360 degrees. So if you want to get that as a percentage, we just have to take that same fraction, 94 over 360, and multiply it by 100. So I'm going to write cricket is equal to 94 over 360 multiplied by 100. And of course, we could do that on the calculator. We could just put 94 divided by 360 multiply by 100. Press equal and we get 26.111. So they didn't tell us how much decimal places to write this answer. So we just stick the three significant figures. So 26, that's one, two, and this one here is the third significant figure. So 26.1. So this is equal to 26.1%. Now for part three, they are saying that given that 40 students chose tennis, so we can stop right there. So 40 students chose tennis. So this 45 degrees is equivalent to 40 students. So let's write that. 45 degrees upper equal to 40 students. And now they're asking us, calculate the total number of students in the group. So first I'll find out how many students are equivalent to one degree. So I'll put one degree now, in order to get one degree here, I'll have to divide this 45 by 45 to get one. 45 over 45 is one. So if I'm dividing the left-hand side of the equal sign by 45 to get one, I must also divide the right-hand side by 45 as well. So I'm going to have 40 over 45. And now remember, the full revolution, your total, is 360 degrees, which will also be equivalent to the total number of students. So in order to get 360 degrees on the left-hand side, I'll have to multiply this 1 by 360 degrees, and I'll get 360 degrees. And I must also do the same thing on the right-hand side here to multiply this by 360 degrees. So I'm going to get 40 over 45 multiplied by 360. All right, so working that out on the calculator, that's 40 divided by 45, multiply by 360, and I will get 320. So that's 320 students in total. So what I would write is that the 360 degrees is equal to 320 students. Therefore, the total number of students is equal to 320. Hmm. All right, so now for part B, we have the diagram below shows a frequency polygon of the number of goals scored by a football team in 25 matches. 
So this is the frequency polygon here. We can see the number of matches on the y-axis and the number of goals on the x-axis. Now here we have a table where the number of matches is the frequency. So number of matches, the y-axis lines up with the number of matches here. And the number of goals on the x-axis lines up with the number of goals here. They are asking us to complete the following table using the information on the diagram. So we have here missing and here missing. So we have number of matches, five, goals scored, zero. And we can see that here, number of matches, five, goals score, zero. Number of matches, seven, goals score, one. Number of matches, seven, goals score is one. So then what's supposed to be the number of matches when the number of goals scored is two? So we're coming down here where the number of goals scored is two. And let's draw a line. We'll touch here and then go across here. And this will be your answer. So the number of matches will be three when the number of goals scored is two. So therefore the number of matches will be three. So now we can do the same thing here. If we look for the um, number of goals scored, which is five, and let's see what the number of matches will be. So you come down here for the number of goals scored, which is five. And you go all the way up like this. So we'll touch here. And we go across. And we have the number of matches is two. So I'm going to put the number of matches here is two. Now for part two, they're asking, what is the modal number of goals scored by the team? Now, you know the mode is the thing that occurs the most. And to know the thing that occurs the most, you look at the frequency. So whatever has the highest frequency will be occurring the most. So let's look at the frequency, which is the number of matches. And we can see that here, 7 is the highest frequency. Therefore, the mode would be 1 goal. Because 1 goal occurred 7 times. Therefore, 1 goal occurred the most. So I'm going to write mode is equal to one goal scored. Now moving on to part three, we are asked to determine the median number of goals scored by the team. So we could write out zero five times and one seven times and two three times and so on and, you know, try to find the middle. Or we can use the cumulative frequency. So let's set up this table with the cumulative frequency. Okay, so here I drew a table taking this information here and put it in this form. So we have the goal scored, which is X, so the number of goals scored here, all these numbers from 0 to 6, that's laid out here from 0 to 6. Then my number of matches, which is my frequency, so number of matches, my frequency. We have 5, 7, 3, 3, 4, 2, 1. So you see that 5, 7, 3, 3, 4, 2, 1. And here I'll have my cumulative frequency. So now to do the commutative frequency, we'll start with our first frequency, which is 5. So we put 5 here. And now we say 5 plus 7, which is 12. And then we say 12 plus 3, which is 15. Then 15 plus 3, which is 18. And 18 plus 4, which is 22. And 22 plus 2, which is 24 and 24 plus 1, which is 25. And this 25 will also be our total frequency, which means we have a total of 25 matches. And if we look back at the information here, they told us that the diagram below shows the frequency polygon of the number of goals scored by a football team in 25 matches. So we know the total number of matches is 25. So that will also mean that sigma f, the sum of all your frequencies, would be 25. So now, how are we going to use this to determine the median? Now the median is the halfway point of the data, so we have a total of 25 matches in all. So I'm going to put sigma f equal 25 implies that n is equal to 25. Okay? And for my median... It will be equal to a half the n plus one-th term. And of course, n is 25, which is sigma f. So we'd have a half 25 plus 1, which is 26. So that's a half of 26. And a half of 26 is 13. 
So the median is going to be 13th term. So the median is not 13. Okay, it's the, that's the 13th term. So this is where the cumulative frequency comes in. Where would be the 13th term? So this 5 would mean our first term to our fifth term would be 0 goals scored. So my first to my fifth, of course, that's 0 goals. Well, it would be a 0. So the first term to the fifth term would be a 0. After 5 is 6. So now our sixth term, so we're stopping at 12. So our 12th term would be a 1, 1 goal scored. Okay, after 12 is 13. And that's the number we're looking for. So from the 13th term to the 15th term would be 2 goals scored. And that's what we want. The median is the 13th term. And from the 13th term to the 15th term will be all 2s. Therefore, the median is just 2. So my median is equal to two goals scored. Now part four, they want us to calculate the mean number of goals scored by the team. So what I'll do, I'll need to bring back this table here to work out what is sigma xf, because the mean is sigma xf over sigma f. And of course, you know, this is x and this is f. Okay, so I brought back my table with my number of goals scored, which is X, and the number of matches, which is my frequency F. And what I want is a column here, which is X, F. X multiplied by F. So this X value multiplied by this F value. So we have 0 multiplied by 5, which is just 0. Then you're going to have this 1 multiplied by 7, which is just 7. Then you're going to have 2 multiplied by 3, which is 6. Then you're going to have 3 by 3, which is 9. Then 4 by 4, which is 16. Then you're going to have 5 times 2, which is 10. And then 6 times 1, which is just 6. And now what we want to do is add up all these numbers here, which will be sigma xf. So sigma xf is equal to, and we can use our calculator to do this. So we'll have 0 plus 7 plus 6 plus 9 plus 16 plus 10 plus 6. And that's equal to 54. So sigma xf is equal to 54. So now the mean is equal to sigma xf over sigma f, which is equal to sigma xf is 54 over sigma f, which is 25. So that'll be equal to, and of course we use our calculator for that. So get us clear this off and put 54 divided by 25, which is equal to 2.16. So our mean is 2.16. And of course, that is 2.16 schools scored. Okay. So here we have question 6, part A. And in this question, I'm going to take the value of pi to be 22 over 7. Now, the same that in the diagram below, not drawn to scale, shows the cross section of a circular metal disc of radius 21 millimeters. A square hole with side 6 millimeters is located at the center of the disc. So this is a square hole here. A square has four equal sides, so each side is going to be 6 millimeters. And this is the center here, and this 21 millimeters will be the radius of this circular disc. Now the first question, part 1, is to find the circumference of the disc. So you know the formula for circumference is simply 2 pi r. So I'm going to use C to represent circumference is equal to 2 pi r. And of course, we're taking pi as 22 over 7. So this will be 2 multiplied by 22 over 7 multiplied by the radius, which is 21. Now I can work that straight on the calculator using the fraction button. So I can press 2 multiplied by 22, press the fraction button. So that's 22 over 7 and then multiply by 21. And you can see we get 132. Now, if I were to work this out without the calculator, I'll put the 2 over 1, 
multiply by 22 over 7, multiply by 21 over 1. And the only thing we'll cancel here is the 7 with the 21. So I'll say 7 to 7, 1. 7 to 21 is 3. And now I'll have 2 multiplied by 22 multiplied by 3. So if I go on the calculator and press 2 multiplied by 22 multiplied by 3, you can see we get 132. So my circumference is 132 millimeters. Now for part two of the question, they want the area in millimeters squared of the cross section of the disc. Now, although this is a circle and you would find the area of a circle, we have this square hole at the center of the circle. So what we'll have to do is find the area of the square hole, find the area of the entire circle, and subtract the area of the square hole from the area of the circle, and that will be the area of the cross section of the disc. Notice they said area of the cross section of the disc, not area of the circle. So area of circle is equal to pi r squared. And of course, we're using pi as 22 over 7 multiplied by the radius, which is 21 squared. All right, so let's use the calculator and work that out. All right, so I'll put the 22 over 7 multiplied by 21 and let's square that. And that will be equal to 1,386. So that's 1,386 millimeters squared. Now remember, this is not the final answer. We still have to find the area of the square. And of course, the area of a square is side by side. So area of square is equal to side by side. And each side is 6 millimeters. So 6 by 6, which is 36 millimeters squared. So now the area of the cross section is equal to the 1,386 take away this 36 millimeter squared. So that'd be equal to 1,386 take away 36, which is equal to 1,350. So I'll have here 1,350 millimeters squared. So now for part three of the question, they say given that the thickness of the disc is two millimeters, calculate the maximum number of discs that can be constructed from 1,000 centimeters cubed. So this is volume, all right, of available metal. So they're saying that one cm cube is equal to 1,000 millimeters cube. Now remember, we calculated the cross section of this disc to be 1,350 millimeters squared. Now, if you want the volume, if the metal is two millimeters thick, you have to multiply the cross-sectional area by that thickness, which we will call the height. All right. So this 1,350 multiplied by this two millimeters will give us the volume of metal for this disc. All right. So let's calculate the volume of the disc. So volume of the disc is equal to the cross-sectional area times the height and of course that cross-sectional area was 1350 times the height which is the two millimeters okay and that will be equal to 2700 millimeters cube now in order to answer this question to calculate the maximum number of discs that can be constructed from 1000 cm cube now notice this is cm cube but our volume here is in millimeters cube so we'll have to convert this 2700 millimeters cube into centimeters cube before we could calculate how many discs we could get out of this 1000 cm cube now they give us this little conversion here one cm cube is equal to 1000 millimeters cube so I'll write the conversion this way that 1000 millimeters cube is equal to 1 cm cube. Now the reason we put this 1000 millimeters cube first is because we want to convert this 2700 millimeters cube to centimeters cube. So first I'll have to find out how much is 1 millimeter cube in terms of centimeters cube. So in order to find out what's 1 millimeter cube, if I divide this left hand side by 1000, I'll get 1. However, I do the one side of the equal sign, you must do to the other side of the equal sign. So dividing this by 1,000 to get one millimeter cube, 
I'll have to divide this by 1,000 as well. So I'll have 1,000 over 1,000 millimeters cubed is equal to 1 over 1,000 cm cubed. And of course, this is 1 millimeter cubed is equal to 1 over 1,000 cm cubed. Now, I want to convert this 2700 millimeters cubed to centimeters cubed. So, how do I get 2700 millimeters cubed on this side? Well, I'll multiply 1 by 2700. Okay? So, 2700 times 1 millimeter cubed will give us 2700 millimeters cubed. And therefore, I must do the same thing on this side. Multiply this by 2700 as well. So, we'll have 2700 multiply by 1 over 1,000. Okay, so 2,700 by 1 is just 2,700 millimeters cube, which is equal to 2,700 over 1,000. Now, because you're dividing by 1,000, we decide to move the decimal point three spaces here, so you get um, 2.7. Of course, this is uh, centimeters cube here, centimeters cube. So I'll have 2700 millimeters cube is equal to 2.7 centimeters cube. So now that I know the volume of this one disc is 2.7 centimeters cube, and the total amount of metal available to me is 1000 cm cube, to find out how many discs I can get out of this 1000 cm cube, I'll have to divide this 1000 by this. 2.7. So my number of disk is equal to volume of metal over volume of disk. And that'll be equal to 1000 divided by 2.7. All right, because this 1,000 is centimeters cube, and this 2.7 is in centimeters cube. So same units, so we can divide them. So now if we do that on the calculator, we have 1,000 divided by 2.7, and that'll be equal to 370.37. And if the three significant figures is just 370, but if you want to include a little decimal, please, uh, we can stop at a 3 here, and after a 3 is a 7, so this could be 4, so 370.4. So we'll have 370.4 disks. All right, so moving on to part B of this question six, we have a globe is a scaled spherical representation of the Earth. The actual length of the equator is 40,000 kilometers and is represented on the globe by a piece of string length 160 centimeters. So basically we have, um, a globe, you know, representing the Earth, and 160 centimeters on that globe, you know, like, like a map, okay, so 160 centimeters on this map is 40,000 kilometers actual distance, okay? So this is what we're going to be working with, and I want to know what length of string would represent an actual distance of 500 kilometers. So first, we'll do have to do our conversion, so we have 160 centimeters of string representing 40,000 kilometers actual distance. Now, seeing that I want the actual distance in kilometers first, I would write the 40,000 first and then the 160. So I'll write 40,000 kilometers is equal to 160 centimeters of string. Now, what I'll have to find out is what is one kilometers in terms of the um, string on the map, and then I can find out for 500 kilometers. So same principle apply, whatever you do to one side of the equal sign, you must do the same thing to the other side of the equal sign. So if I want to get one kilometer here, I have to divide this left hand side by 40,000, which means I have to divide the right hand side by 40,000 as well. So I'll have, I can just do it fast. All right, I'll have one kilometer here is equal to because, you know, I divide this by 40,000 to get 1. Which means I divide in here by 40,000 as well. So, 160 divided by 40,000. Alright, CM. 
And now if I want to get 500 kilometers, I'll multiply this 1 by 500. So 1 by 500 is 500. So I write it one time. So 500 kilometers is equal to, and I must do the same thing to this side by multiplying by 500. So 160 over 40,000 multiplied by 500. I'll just work this whole thing out on the calculator. All right, so I have my 500 kilometers actual distance is equal to, all right, we put the 160 over 40,000 multiplied by 500. And we get two. Okay, so that's just two centimeters of string. All right, so our answer is just two centimeters. So I can just make a little statement here that, you know, 500 kilometers is represented by two centimeters of string. Hmm. Now, continuing part two of this question, we have the distances between, you know, this place that starts with a P and this next place that starts with a Q. So two places, P and Q, right, is represented on the globe. So same globe which means the same um, conversion applies, you know, 40,000 kilometers actual distance is 160 centimeters of string on the globe, which is the map, all right? And of course, you know, 500 kilometers is represented by two centimeters of string, which means one centimeter of string representing 250 kilometers, right? You know, you divide this by two, you divide this by two. So those same values apply in here, all right? So what we have is that the length of string is 25 centimeters. That is the distance between P and Q. Now they want us to calculate the value of PQ, the actual distance in kilometers. Now I could just go back here and take what we work out here that, you know, two centimeters represents 500 kilometers. And then work it back where, you know, one centimeter represents 250 kilometers. So let's take this here. Two centimeters represents 500 kilometers. And seeing that we're dealing with the string first in centimeters, I would write the 2cm first is equal to 500 kilometers. Okay, so if I divide this by 2, I'll get 1, so 1cm. And of course, you know, I'll divide this side by 2 as well. Okay, I can write that out. That's easy to work out, 250. Of course, this is kilometers. So now we want to know what is 25 centimeters of string. So I'll multiply 1 by 25 and get 25. Which means I'll multiply this side by 25 as well. So 250 by 25. So 25 cm, okay, on the map is equal to, and we have 250 multiplied by 25. And we get 6,250. And that will be 6,250 kilometers. So we're going to have 25 centimeters of string represents 6,250 kilometers. So moving on to question seven, which is your sequence question. We have a sequence of figures is made from squares of unit length. The first three figures in the sequence are shown below. So we have squares here. We've seen a pattern, figure one, figure two, figure three. So you have to observe this um, pattern and see what's going on. So I'm seeing this shape here. I'm seeing it repeated here. And then we have these two blocks at the side of it. Then I'm seeing the same shape here. See, two, two, one, two, two, one. And then I have these two blocks at the side of it. So the fourth figure for me will just be repeating the same pattern and adding two blocks at the side here. All right, so here I've just repeated this figure three here. And now to continue to make it figure four. So I just had to add one square here and then one square above. So I'm adding my square here at the side. And now I'm adding a next square above here. And this would be my figure four. All right, so I'm going to put figure four here. 
Okay, so now part B of question 7, we have study the pattern of numbers in each row of the table below. So each row, we have a pattern of numbers. Each row relates to one of the figures in the sequence of figures on page 22. So that'll be talking about um, these figures here. Okay. So some rows have not been included in the table. So we want to complete the rows numbered 1, 2, and 3. So we want to complete row 1, which is this row here, row 2, which is this row here, and row 3, which is this row here. So in row 1, we have here missing and here missing. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4. So what number should go here and what number should go here? So let's look at the pattern. We have 3, 5, 7. You know, that's odd numbers, right? So 3, 5, 7, the next one should be 9. So 9 should go here. Then we have 8, 12, 16. So not so obvious, right? But the difference between 8 and 12 is 4. And between 12 and 16 is also 4. So we're going up by 4 here. So 8 plus 4 is 12, 12 plus 4 is 16, so 16 plus 4 is 20. So I'm writing here is 9, and we could put, um, you know, this going up by 2, you know. 3 plus 2 is 5, 5 plus 2 is 7. So here will be 7 plus 2, which is 9. And of course, you know, 8 plus 4 is 12, 12 plus 4 is 16, so here will be 16 plus 4, which is 20. Now, when it comes to this part, two part, where we had to figure out, you know, the number of squares in the figure is 43. What should um, this figure number be? And of course, what the parameter should be here. I prefer we call for the nth term first and then come back and with part two. So let's figure out the formula for the nth term when the figure number is n. So when the figure number is 1, the number of squares is 3. When the figure number is 2, the number of squares is 5 and so on. So what's the general formula when, you know, I could put any number for the figure number and find out the number of squares? Well, the common difference here is 2, right? Between 3 and 5 is 2, between 5 and 7 is 2. So I'll use that 2. I multiply 2 by 1, and I'll get 2. How could, how could I get 3 after that? So 2 by 1 is 2, and if I add 1, I'll get 3. 2 by 2 is 4, and if I add 1, I'll get 5. 2 by 3 is 6, and if I add 1, I'll get 7. So 2 times n plus 1. Now, if you're asking, how did I know to use 2? Well, I always try to use the common difference, right? So the difference between these two is 2. Between these is 2. So you call that the common difference. That's why now I'm going to multiply by 2. So I multiply 1 by 2. And then I add 1 to get 3. I multiply 2 by 2. I get 4. Then I add 1 to get 5. I multiply 3 by 2. I get 6. Then I add 1 to get 7. So my general formula here is 2n plus 1. Now let's see what's going on here now. The common difference here is 4, right? Between 8 and 12 is 4, between 12 and 16 is 4. So if I multiply this 1 by 4, because 4 is the common difference, how would I get 8? Well, 1 by 4 is 4, and if I add 4, I'll get 8. If I multiply this 2 by 4, I'll get 8, and if I add 4, I'll get 12. If I multiply 3 by 4, I'll get 12, and if I add 4, I'll get 16. If I multiply 4 by 4, I'll get 16, and if I add 4, I'll get 20. So you see what's going on there? We're multiplying this, the figure number, which is n now, so 4 times n, and I have to add 4. So the nth term for my parameter would be 4 times n, because n is the figure number, plus 4. Now, trying to figure out part 2 now, you know, what number should come here and here. Let's work with the figure number first, because we have this 43 is the number of squares, and we have the nth term for the number of squares is 2n plus 1, where n is the figure number. So if you want the figure number here, I'll just put this equal to this, and solve for n, and I'll get the figure number. So I'll have 2n plus 1 is equal to 43. Transfer the positive 1 across, and we'll have 2n is equal to 43, take away 1. So we have 2n is equal to 42. Transfer 2 across, turn to division. So we'll have 42 divided by 2, which is 21. And therefore, we know the figure number is 21 when the number of squares is 43. So I'll come in here and put 21. And now that we know the figure number is 21 for part 2, we can call the parameter because this is the nth term for the parameter. So parameter is equal to 4n plus 4 when the figure number is n. So I'm going to put P is equal to 4n plus 4. And when 
the figure number is 21. So when n is 21, we're going to have p is equal to 4 times n, which is 21, plus 4. So 4 times 21 is 84, plus 4, which is 88. So my parameter is 88 when my figure number is 21. So we get 88 here. And that's it. We have completed the table. So now for part C, we have to determine the relationship between the number of squares S and the parameter P of the figure. So I just brought back the table here so that we can look at the number of squares S and the parameter P. So now if I want the relationship between S and P, I'll just look at the n terms here. You know, this 2n plus 1 and this 4n plus 4. And I'll say, you know what? Well, this one bigger, right? So I'll just subtract these two and see what the relationship between them would be. And now seeing that P is always bigger than S, I'll put the P first, then the S. So I'll put P take away S is equal to 4n plus 4, which is P, take away S, which is 2n plus 1. So I'll have 4n plus 4. If I expand my brackets here, I'll get a negative 2n and negative by, well, negative 1 by positive 1 is negative 1. I'll bring my n's together, so the 4n together with the negative 2n, and then put the positive 4 together with the negative 1. And this would be 2n, and this will give you 3, so positive 3. So that's p take away s. So now if we look at this table for the figure number 1, and we look at the difference between the parameter and the number of squares, you know, a take away 3 is 5. So for figure one, and we look at this here, this is the parameter, take away the number of squares. So if we put figure one in here, two times one is two plus three is five. So you can see that this would give the relationship between the parameter and the number of squares. All right, let's check it for this one here. Um, difference between 12 and five is seven for the figure number being two. So you put the figure number two here, two times two is four plus three is seven. And that way you can get the relationship between the parameter and the number of squares. That the parameter is seven more than the number of squares for figure number two. So this would be the general formula to represent that. So here we have question eight, which is the first question for section two. So we have for part A in the diagram on page 25. So that would be this diagram here. It shows six points of the function y is equal to 3x plus 1 over x. So let's see. Point number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now they're saying that the coordinates of these six points are given in table below. So we have the x part of the coordinates on top here. And we have the y part of the coordinates below here. Now we can clearly see that here is missing and here is missing. So for part one, they want us to complete the table above by calculating and inserting the missing values of y, which just means to fill out these two values that are missing here. So we want to know what is y when x is 0.5 and what is y when x is 2. So we have our function here, y is equal to 3x plus 1 over x. So I'll simply put when x is 0.5. All right, we're going to have y is, our function is, 3x plus 1 over x. So that simply means replacing the x in our function with 0.5. So we're going to have y is equal to 3 times 0 0.5, 0 0.5, plus 1 over 0 0.5. Now we can work this whole thing out on the calculator. So let's bring the calculator up. All right, so I'll type the information exactly how I see it there. So I'll put 3 open brackets, put the 0 0.5, 0 0.5, close the brackets, then I put plus, and for the 1 over 0 0.5, we could use the fraction button, or we could do open brackets 1 divided by 0 0.5. So I'll do it both ways. So you could open brackets like this, and put 1 divided by 0 0.5, and close brackets, and press equal, and we get 3.5 as the answer. Let's do it with the fraction button now. So press 3, open brackets, 0 0.5, close brackets, plus, 1 over, so let's say a fraction button here, so press this for over 0. 0.5 and press equal, and you see we still get 
So for here, I'm putting 3.5. Now I'll work out for when x is equal to 2. So I'll have when x is equal to 2, our function still is 3x plus 1 over x. So we have y is equal to 3 times x, which is 2, plus 1 over 2. So y is equal to, forget to put the answer here, so y is equal to 3.5. And again, I'll use the calculator, so let's play this off. So 3 open brackets, 2 close brackets, so that's a 3 multiplied by 2, plus, and for the half, I'll use the fraction button, so 1 over 2. Press equal, we get 6.5. Now I'm plotting points, so yes, I know 6.5 is 6.5. So if I wanted to convert the 6.5, which is a mixed number, to include the decimal, I'll just have to press the fraction button again. See, and it's into 6.5. And of course, I'll prefer the 6.5 because I'm looking at the table and, you know, they didn't put any fractions on the table. They only use decimals. So I will use the decimal form, which is 6.5. All right, so I'll just put the 6.5 here as well. So now I have completed the table. So now for part two of the question, we have on the diagram on page 25, which is this diagram I'm talking about again. The ordered pairs shown in the table have been plotted, except for the missing ones. So use your answers in A part one, right? Plot the missing points and connect all the points with a smooth curve. So we have six points here already. And we want to use our answers that we worked out in A part one to fill in the table. So that's the 3.5 with the 0.5 when x is 0.5, we know y is 3.5. And when x is 2, y is 6.5. So now looking at the x-axis, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5 blocks. And now we want to plot where is 0.5 on the x-axis. So obviously half of 5 is 2.5. So two and a half blocks will represent 0.5. That's two and a half of the one centimeter blocks. So 0.5 will be in the middle right here. And now we're going to map that to 3.5 on the y-axis. So 3.5 on the y-axis, this is three here, this is four. We have two blocks. We have two blocks separating three and four. Therefore, 3.5 is right here in the middle. So we come in here with 3.5 and line that up with 0.5 on the x. So 0.5 on the x is two and a half blocks. One, two and a half right here. Go all the way up to 3.5, which is right here. And that's our point. Next, we map two on the x with 6.5 on the y. So that's simple for the x. The two is right here. You can see that. But the 6.5 will be between six and seven. So that will be in the middle right here. So we can just come across on 6.5. We can see the two clearly. Going to line up here at 2. And we're going to plot that point right here. So now that we have our two points plotted, it's time to make a smooth curve to connect all these points. All right, not the best, but it's a freehand curve to try to connect all these points with a smooth curve. So this will be a graph here. Now coming down to part three here, they say by drawing an appropriate straight line on the diagram on page 25, so that's this diagram again, find approximate solutions to the equation 3x plus 1 over x is equal to 6. So now the way we're going to look at this is that we're going to have two graphs. One graph is going to be y is equal to 3x plus 1 over x, and that'll be our first equation. And the other graph is going to be y is equal to 6. And that'll be our second equation. So now we already have the graph for this equation 1. This is what we drew here. And if we draw the graph for y is equal to 6, the point of intersection or the points of intersection between these two graphs will be the solution to this equation. So y is equal to 6, you're going to find 6 on the y-axis and draw a horizontal line across. So I'm doing that now, making this straight line across. And this will be line y is equal to 6. And of course, this graph here is y is equal to 3x plus 1 over x. And these two graphs, they intersect here and here. So I have a point intersection here. 
and a point intersection right here. Now remember, this was a freehand drawing, so of course the answers will be an approximation. So we have two points of intersection, so how does that help us solve the equation? Now remember, this is the equation here, so we want to solve for the value or values of x for this equation. So this point of intersection would have a x part of the coordinate and a y part of the coordinate. Now obviously the y part of the coordinate is 6 for both points of intersection. So what we want is the x part of the coordinate for both of them. And that will be your answers for this equation. Now in order to do that, you can see where this is located. I'll need to know what each little block representing to be able to read off the x part of the coordinate for here. So now if we look down here on the x-axis, we have um, from 0 to 1, that's 1 unit. And each 1 centimeter block has 5 little blocks. And we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5 1 centimeter blocks in total. And each of them have 5 little blocks. So that'll be 5 by 5, which is 25 little blocks. Which means for the x-axis, one of the smallest blocks will be representing 1 as the 1 unit over the 25 little blocks. So that's 1 over 25. So I'm just going to write here, for the x-axis, one of the smallest blocks is equal to 1 over 25. So the 1 is because the x-axis, the unit is 1, mean we count it in 1s, right? 0 to 1, that's 1. 1 to 2, that's the next 1. You know, we're going up by 1, so 1 unit. That's why here's 1. And the space between that one unit is 25 little blocks. And that's why we have 25 here. So if I get my calculator and I put 1 divided by 25 on my calculator, I'll get 0 0.04. So that means one of the smallest blocks is 0 0.04. And that's for the x-axis. So I'm going to have this is equal to 0 0.04. So let's look at something here. This space in here, we have one, two, three, four. We have four little blocks. All right. So four little blocks is going to be this 0 0.04 multiplied by four. All right. So my answers going to be X is equal to, and I'll go on my calculator and I'll put four multiplied by 0 0.04 and I'll get 0 0.16. So I'll write 0 0.16, that's my first answer. And now for a second answer, we come to this point of intersection. So it looks like this point is directly on this line. So if you come all the way down, we see in the x value will be here. So if you look, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, 1 centimeter blocks away from 1. So now we know that each of the 1 centimeter blocks have 5 little blocks. And we have one, two, three, four of them to reach this point. So four by five, four by five of the little blocks, right? Will be 20 little blocks away from one. So we just have to multiply that um, 20 by 0 0.04. And we find out how far away from one, you know, this point here is. Okay. So we just multiply 20 by 0 0.04. And we find out how far away from one this point here is. So if you go to the calculator, and multiply 0 0.04 by 20, we get 0 0.8, and that's how far away from 1 the point is, right? So we'll have 1.8. That's where this point could be, 1.8. And our second answer will be x is equal to 1.8. And those will be your answers for this question. Okay, let's put um, x is equal to 0 0.16 or x is equal to 1.8. So moving on to part B of this question, we have the speed time graph below shows the information on the first 60 seconds of a car's journey. So that's sky graph. We have time below here, so from 0 to 60, that's the car's journey. So here we have the speed in meters per second, so that means the distance is in meters, and of course the time is in seconds. Now, part one of the question, they want us to calculate the acceleration in meters per second squared of the car during stage B. So this is stage B here. And as we know, for a speed time graph, the gradient of the line would give acceleration. So we want the gradient between this point and this point, which would be stage B, and that would be equal to the acceleration. So I'll just form this triangle here. 
So now we know this distance here will be the change in y, which is a vertical distance, and this here, horizontal, will be the change in x. So for the vertical distance, we start here and we go across, we have from, well, here will be 15. Because here is 10, here is 20, and here is in the middle. So the difference between 10 and 20 is 10, and half of that is 5. So 10 plus 5, 15. And then we're going all the way up to here, which is 40. So I'm going to put my change in y is equal to 40 take away 15. And 40 take away 15 is 25. So that's my change in y. So I can write here the change in y is equal to 25. Now let's look at our horizontal distance. We have from 40, as you can see here, to 60. So we just have to take away 60 from 40 and we get our change in x. So our change in x is equal to 60 take away 40. And that would be 20. So here our change in x is 20. Now some points to note is that um, as we go from left to right, the line is going upwards, which means the gradient is positive. If the line was going downwards, as we go from left to right, the gradient will be negative. So now my gradient m is equal to a change in y over the change in x. So gradient is equal, the change in y is 25 over a change in x, which is 20. We work that out on the calculator. All right, so we have 25 divided by 20, and we will get 1.25. So that's 1.25 as our gradient. And of course, we are saying that the gradient is equal to acceleration. So my acceleration, A, is equal to 1.25 meters per second squared. So now for part two of this question, they want us to calculate the average speed of the car during stage B. So this is stage B here. Now you know average speed will be the total distance over time taken. Now the time taken is easy because we can read off we stop at 60 seconds and we, well stage B started at 40 seconds, right? So the difference between 40 and 60 is 20. So your time taken is 20 seconds. Okay, so I can write out that, that's the easiest one. All right, for stage B, all right, Time taken is the difference between 60 seconds and 40 seconds. So that's 20 seconds. So now the question is, what is the distance for stage B? Now we know the area under the graph represents distance for a speed time graph. So I'd just like to mark off stage B. We have here. We have here. All right, so you can see I blocked off stage B and we can see the area under this line. Now this shape is a trapezium, all right? So let's get the dimensions of the sides of the trapezium. Now it's obvious that this side here is the 20 seconds, so that has to be 20. All right, so down here we have 20. The length of this side would be all the way up to 40. So this is 40. Now the length of this side here would have been 15. So this is 15. Now remember, I'm, I'm looking across here, right? This is 15 here, so the length of this side is 15. Don't worry about the units, all right? Um, from zero to all the way up here is 40, so the length of this side is 40. And of course, from 40 to 60, this is 20, so the length of this side here is 20. Now, I don't need the length of this side. We know the area of a trapezium is a half the sum of the two parallel sides, so that'll be the 15 and the 40, multiplied by the height, which will be the which will be the distance that's perpendicular to the two parallel sides. So the height is going to be 20. If you want, I could put these um, arrows here to identify the parallel sides. And of course, this is your right angle here. So I'm going to go area of trapezium is equal to half the sum of the two parallel sides, which is 15 plus 40, multiplied by the height, which is that 20, the distance that's perpendicular to the two parallel sides. Now, obviously, 15 plus 40, that's 55. All right, times 20. All right, so a half times 55 times 20. 
All right, so we can that out. I mean, you can put 0.5 for a half or use the fraction button. So one over two, that's a half. Multiply by 55, multiply by 20, and we get 550. All right, so we have 550. Don't worry about the units. Now, the thing is, the area of the trapezium, which is the area under this line for stage B, is the total distance for stage B. So we're going to have total distance is equal to 550. And now we said the distance was in meters, right? Because our speed was in meters per second. So distance in meters times in seconds. So now we have the total distance for stage B and the time taken. So speed is, well, average speed is the total distance over the time taken. So average speed is equal to my total distance over time taken. And that's equal to my total distance, 550 over the time taken, which is 20. All right, so we can that out, we have 550 divided by 20. And we'll get 27.5. Okay, so that's our average speed. Of course, that'll be meters per second. All right, so that's equal to 27.5 meters per second. Now, for part three of this question, we have at time t is 60 seconds, the car starts to slow down with uniform deceleration of 2.5 meters per second squared. Now, remember we said that acceleration was the gradient of the line. So the acceleration for stage A will be the gradient of this line for stage A. The acceleration for stage B was the gradient of this line for stage B. Now, the thing about both stage A and stage B is that these lines have a positive gradient, and that's why it's acceleration. Now, deceleration would have a negative gradient. So still working out gradient, um, deceleration is just negative acceleration, so negative gradient deceleration all right so that means from this point we are come all the way down to zero now for a time i would not know you know where to bring this line down but for the speed i know we are starting at 40 and we need to go all the way down to zero from 40 all the way down to zero to come to rest rest means the speed is zero meters per second so essentially what we have here is that the gradient m is equal to negative 2.5 all right because that's where the deceleration could be gradient We'll have our change in y over our change in x being our gradient, which is negative 2.5. And the change in y would be from 4 to, to 0. All right? Now, usually when we have a negative gradient, we represent the change in y as negative. So I represent that as negative 4 to. So we have negative 4 to over the change in x is equal to negative 2.5. So if you want to get rid of any negative signs, you could do that because if here's negative and here's negative, then 4 to over a change in x is just 2.5. So with that out of the way, what we want to know is the change in x, which is the horizontal distance, which will give us, you know, the time it takes to decelerate. So you could do some simple cross multiplication here. We could just put the 4 to over the change in x is equal to 2.5 over 1. We multiply the change in x by 2.5. So we have 2.5 times the change in x. I multiply the 40 by 1. And that will be equal to 40. So now my change in x is equal to 40 divided by 2.5. So my change in x is equal to all right, so that's going to work that out on the calculator. 40 divided by 2.5, and we get 16. So that's 16 seconds. All right, so that's 16. My change in x, seconds. All right, so the car comes to rest in 16 seconds. So here we have question 9, part A. We have the diagram below, not drawn to scale, shows the relative positions of three reservoirs, B, F, and G, all on ground level. The distance BF is equal to 32 kilometers. So that's B to F is 32 kilometers right here. We have FG is 55 kilometers, so F to G, 55 kilometers. 
and we have angle BFG. Now you know the angle is located at the letter in the middle, so the angle is at F. So if you go B, F, G, so at F, 103 degrees. So angle BFG, 103 degrees. And we're saying and F is on a bearing of 42 degrees from B. Now you know you're putting north line on the from, so from B, north line on B, that's why we're in north line here. And we're taking the angle in a clockwise direction. So 42 degrees in a clockwise direction, that's the bearing of F from B. So now for part one, they want us to determine the bearing of B from F. Now since it's from F, we are putting north line on F. So let's do that. So I have my north line here. And now we want the angle in a clockwise direction. That's going all the way around here to this line connecting F to B. Now before I do that, I recognize that this north line here and this north line here are parallel lines. And once we have parallel lines, we can look out for alternate angles or corresponding angles. Now here I can see the Z. If I were to extend this line further down, we would have our Z here, and therefore this little piece of angle here will be 42 degrees. Now I'm just going to highlight the Z for you. So what we're going to have is the angle here would be 42 degrees. So now this north line, this whole line here is a straight line, so this whole angle here is 180 degrees. So I'm going to put here is 180 degrees. So now we have the 180 plus 42, and that will be the bearing of B from F. So you see, in a clockwise direction, you have 180, then plus 42. So you're going from a north line all the way around to connect to this line that connects F to B. All right, so I have the bearing of B from F would simply be 180 degrees plus 42 degrees. And that will be 222 degrees. So now here we have part two, where we want to calculate the distance BG, giving your answer to one decimal place. So if you look at the diagram that they give us, this is a non-right angle triangle. This is BG, which means we either use any sine rule or the cosine rule to solve for the missing side. Now if I look at the pattern that I have here, I have this 103 degrees is in the middle of these two given sides, which indicates to me that we have to use the cosine rule to find this missing side. Now, I would label this triangle with the common letters, and we know the common letters represents the length of a side, and the capital letters represents the magnitude of an angle. So F would be 103 degrees, G would be the angle wherever it's supposed to be here, and B would be this angle that's supposed to be here. But for now, the only angle we know is F, so capital F is 103 degrees. Now, opposite to this angle would be the common side F, so if it was to draw a line from F, it would go all the way and touch this side, and that's why this will be common F. If you were to draw a line from B, it will go and touch this side, which will be opposite to B, and this will be common B. And if you were to draw a line from G, it will go here and touch this side, and here will be common G. So now to write the cosine rule, we will start with F because that's what we want to find. So it's going to be F squared is equal to the other two sides will be G and B. So G squared plus B squared. And it doesn't matter if you put the B first or the G first. All right? Take away, using back these two letters, G and B, 2GB, cosine the angle, which will be F. So you start with common F, you end with capital F. So now we're going to put in the values for these arm letters. So F squared, well, F is the side BG. So for common F, I'm going to put BG. So I'm going to have BG squared, is equal to common G is this 32 kilometers, so that's going to be 32 squared, plus B, common B is 55 kilometers, so that's going to be 55 squared for B squared. Take away 2 times G, which is 32, times B, which is 55, cosine the angle F, and the angle F is this 103 degrees. So I'm going to put BG squared is equal to, now what I like to do in this situation is to run this whole thing on the calculator. And of course we need to know where to put our brackets on the calculator to do this whole thing. So we're going to put brackets here, and we're going to have brackets here. 
So now I have my calculator up. Look what I'm going to do. So we're going to put open brackets. We're going to put 32 squared. We're going to plus the 55 squared. We're going to close the brackets. We're going to put take away. We're going to open brackets again. And put 2 multiplied by 32 multiplied by 55 multiply by make sure you calculate in degrees for this okay because our one or three angle is in degrees right you know your radians rad or grad if you calculate in any of those modes you're going to get the wrong answer here so when we press this cosine so we are multiplied by right so cosine and we're going to put the 103 and close brackets the calculator is understanding that this 103 is in degrees that's why they, you need to have this deg on top here so i'm going to press equal and we get this um, 4840.8. Now, seeing that the final answer has to be to one decimal place, I'll write this to two decimal places. So for the decimal, we have 0.827. I'm going to stop at the two. And because he has a seven, he is going to go up by one. So 0.83. So I'm going to write 4840.83. So now I'm going to have that BG is equal to because here we have bg squared is equal to this so bg is going to be equal to the square root of this all right so the square root of 4840.83 and when we find the square root of this we write the answer to one decimal place so bg is equal to so here we have the calculator again so we're going with the square root so the square root is second function of the x squared button for me so second function x squared and the square root comes up i'm going to put the 4840.83 press equal and we get 69.57 now remember it's one decimal place so stopping at the five and after it's a seven so 69.6 so we're going to have bg is 69.6 kilometers and that's your answer to one decimal place. So now for part three, we have calculate to the nearest degree, the bearing of G from B. So we know the from is where we put in the north line. So from B, north line is on B. Now we already have a north line on B here. And we want the bearing of G from B. So from a clockwise direction from this north line, we want to go until we meet the line connecting B and G. And that'll be this line here. So essentially, this is the angle that we want. This would be our bearing of G from B. Now, we already have this part here as 42. So what we need to know is this angle here. So we need to know, call this theta, this angle here. And if we could find this angle and add it to 42, that would be the bearing of G from B. So what I'll do, I'll draw this triangle separately. All right, so here I have my triangle with F, B, and G. I'm going to put in the length of sides, which here is 32 kilometers. Here is 55 kilometers. This angle here was 103 degrees. And what we're trying to find is this angle here, theta. Now, if we also look back at the previous page, we worked out the length of the side BG as 69.6 kilometers. So you can put in that as well. So BG is 69.6. So here I'm going to put the 69.6 kilometers. So essentially I know the lengths of all three sides of this non-right angle triangle. And the reason I'm emphasizing non-right angle triangle, because once it's a non-right angle triangle, it's the sine rule or the cosine rule. Now, yes, if you have all three sides, you can use the cosine rule to find the missing angle. But let's see if you can use the sine rule as well. Okay, so we have the length of this side and this angle. And we want to find this angle and we know the length of this side. So that means the sine rule could work. So let's label the triangle. So if here is capital F, then opposite to that, draw a line from F. Come down, touch here. This is common F. This is capital B. Draw a line across. Let's do the same in green. This would be common B. And this is capital G here. If you draw a line, it will touch here, which will be common G. So what I'm saying is that if you look at the sine rule, all right, we want to find this theta here, which is capital B. So we'll be using common B over sine capital B. And the only unknown there will be the capital B, which is theta, the unknown. The next two things we must know, and we can use the common F over sine capital F. So let's write that out. We'll have B over sine B. 
that's the angle B, is equal to, we're using common F, the 69.6, and sine capital F, which is the 103. So common F over sine capital F. So now let's put in the values. Common B is 55 kilometers over sine capital B, and that's the angle theta. So you're going to write theta here is equal to common F is 69.6 and capital F, well, sine capital F is 103. So sine 103 degrees. So what we can do now is cross multiply here. So I'll put equal and I'll have the sine theta by 69.6. So that's 69.6 sine theta. And then I have this 55 multiplied by sine 103. So that's 55 sine 103 degrees. So now we understand that this is 69.6 multiplied by sine theta. So once we transfer the 69.6 across equal sign, the operation will change to division. And we'll get sine theta is equal to 55 sine 103 degrees over 69.6. So sine theta is equal to, I can just do that whole thing on the calculator. So we press 55 sine 103, press equal, and then you can just divide that by 69.6. And we get 0.7699, so on. Or if you want to do it in one shot, we could put open brackets, 55, sine 103 close brackets and then put divided by 69.6 i can see we still get that 0.76999 so on now seeing that we want to arm our angle to the nearest degree i mean i'll just do this to three significant figures okay so one two three after this nine is a nine so this nine will go up by one which will cause the six to go up by one so we have 0.77 so here I'll have 0 0.77. So now if sine theta is 0 0.77, then this theta is the sine inverse of 0 0.77. So theta is equal to, and we go back with the calculator. Let's clear this off. And I'm going to put second function sine. So you see sine inverse comes up. Open brackets, and we're going to put the 0 0.77, close brackets. Press equal, and we get 50.353, so on degrees. Now remember, the city one is still the nearest degree. So 50.3, 3 is less than 5, so the 0 remains the same. So we just go with 50 degrees. So theta is 50 degrees. So now the bearing of G from B is this whole angle here, which is the 42 plus theta, which is 42 plus 50. So I'm just going to write the bearing of G from B will be the 42 degrees plus theta, which is the 42 plus 50 degrees, which is 92 degrees. And that's your answer to the nearest degree. Now we also know that bearings are written using three digits. That's the angle. So if you look back at part A, notice when they give the bearing of F from B, it was 0, 42 degrees, which is 42 degrees. So this is good, but if you want, you can write the bearing as 0, 0.92 degrees. Now, moving on to part B, which is the circle geometry. Well, we have this diagram here. Of course, it's not drawn to scale. It shows a circle with center O, so O is the center. We have the points A, B, C, and M are on the circumference. So you can see that A, B, C, and M. The straight line CN is a tangent to the circle. So you see in CN here, this is a tangent to the circle. And you can see that there's only one point of intersection here. So CN is the tangent. Okay, so it's saying tangent to the circle at the point C, which means it touching the circle at point C. And it's perpendicular to BN. So this is B to N here, and you see the 90 degrees means CN is at right angles to BN. Now, for the first part of the question, they want us to determine giving a reason for our answer, angle ABC. So again, the angle is always at the letter in the middle. So AB will be one arm and BC will be our next arm. So we come here, 
AB one arm and then B to C another arm. That means this is my angle here. Angle A, B, C. Now if you look, this line from A to B passes through the center of the circle and touches the circumference at both ends, which means AB is the diameter. And therefore, this triangle being formed here that's standing on the diameter would be a right angle triangle. I'll highlight that. So this is my right angle triangle here and the right angle will be at this point here. So now that we have this triangle in isolation, we have one, two angles and one missing. And we know if some of the interior angles of a triangle is equal to 180 degrees. So first I'll write my reason for this 90 degree angle being here. And this will be angle ACB or I can say angle BCA, anyone. So angle ACB is equal to 90 degrees. And the reason for that would be angle in a semicircle. So angle in a semicircle. So now we can proceed to finding this angle ABC by adding up the 50 and the 90 and subtracting it from 180 degrees. So angle ABC is equal to 180 degrees, take away 58 degrees plus 90 degrees. So that's equal to, we can just put the whole thing out on the calculator. So we simply have 180, take away open brackets, 58 plus 90. Close brackets and press equal and we get 32 degrees. So angle ABC is 32 degrees. And my reason will be sum of the interior. So INT full stop is short for interior. This is symbol for angles of a triangle is equal to 180 degrees. So next up, we want to find out what is angle CMB. So now if you look at the diagram again, this is C to M to B. So that means this is the angle that we want to find. C to M and then M to B. C to M and then M to B. Now, I am seeing a cyclic quadrilateral, so I'll highlight it for you. So if you notice, this shape has four sides and all four vertices touch the circumference of the circle. So here, 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 and here, which would make it a cyclic quadrilateral. Now, if you had a vertice that wasn't touching the circumference of the circle, it would not be a cyclic quadrilateral. Okay? Now, the thing about a cyclic quadrilateral is that the opposite angles, the opposite interior angles are supplementary, meaning the two of them must add up to 180 degrees. So therefore, 58 and this angle here, which is CMB, must add up to 180 degrees. So essentially, CMB is equal to 180, take away 58. And that will be 122 degrees. Now, of course, your reason is going to be the opposite interior angles of a cyclic quadrilateral are supplementary. So I'm going to write the opposite, so OPP for opposite, interior, INT full stop for interior, angles of a cyclic quadrilateral, so QUAD full stop for quadrilateral, are supplementary. S-U-P-P -P for supplementary. All right, and this would be your reason. All right, so this is your answer, and this is your reason. Now, moving on to part three of the question, we're going to find the angle N-C-M. So that's N to C to M. So that's going to be this little angle right here. So that's N-C-M. So now I'm seeing that here is a right angle. And this would be a right angle triangle here. And I just found out that this angle here is 122 degrees. So let's put that in. This was 122 degrees. Now this is a straight line. So if I was to subtract 122 from 180, I will get this angle here. So this angle here will be CMN. So I'm going to write that. So CMN 
is equal to 180 degrees take away 122 and that's equal to 58 degrees now the reason for that is basically a straight angle right a straight line the angle is 180 degrees so straight angle so I'm gonna put in that this is 58 degrees here 58 so now we could see one two three angles in this triangle only one angle is missing, so you sum of the three interior angles must add up to 180 degrees. So now angle NCM is equal to 180 degrees take away the 90 plus the 58. And that will be equal to, and we can work that out on the calculator. We have 180 take away 90 plus 58 close brackets and that's equal to 32 degrees so we're gonna have 32 degrees here and that will be angle NCM and the reason would be the sum of the interior angles of a triangle is 180 degrees so I'll write sum of the interior angles of a triangle is equal to 180 degrees Now moving on to question 10, which is your vectors and matrices question, we have for part A, a transformation T is defined by the matrix. Well, let's say a transformation matrix here. We have a point A, which is negative 2, 3, is mapped onto the point A prime. So A prime is the image of A after the transformation T, right? So A prime AB on the T, which is a transformation, find the value of A and of B. So as I said, you are going to perform the transformation T on this object coordinates, which is A, and you're going to get your image coordinate, which is A prime. So we know we have to write this coordinate as a column matrix to be able to multiply it with the transformation matrix. So the setup goes like this. Your transformation matrix times your object coordinates will give you your image coordinates. So let's write that. Our transformation matrix will be 2, 2, negative 1, 0, times our object coordinates, which is negative 2, 3, and we write in that as a column matrix, so negative 2, 3, like this. And that's going to give us an answer that will also be a column matrix, which will be A prime, and the first number on top will be A, and the number below will be B. Now, when multiplying matrices, we know we multiply rows in the first matrix by columns in the second matrix. So that'll be rows in the first matrix by the single column in the second matrix. So I'm going to have this 2 by negative 2, which is negative 4, plus this negative 1 by this 3, which is negative 3. Then I'm going to have this 2 down here by this negative 2, which is negative 4, plus this 0 by this 3, which is just 0. So we're going to have this negative 4 and you multiply this positive and negative sign and you get a negative sign. So you get negative 4 take away 3. And this negative 4 plus 0 is just negative 4. So negative 4. Now here I'll add and keep the negative sign. So 4 plus 3 is 7. So that's negative 7. And negative 4. So now this is your A and this is your B. So we're going to have a prime is equal to the negative 7 and negative 4. Therefore, a prime like this is just negative 7 as a coordinate, right? Negative 4. Which means, well, imply that, you know, a is equal to negative 7 and b is equal to negative 4. So now for question 10, a part 2. We want to determine a transformation matrix that maps A prime to A. Now remember this T here mapped A to A prime. All right. So now we want to do the reverse. So if you want a transformation that's going to map A prime to A now, the image to the object is going to be the inverse of this transformation matrix that mapped the object to the image. So I'm just going to write T here as 2, 2, negative 1, 0. I'm going to highlight the leading diagonal. So this here is my leading diagonal. And to get the inverse of this matrix, you know, you have to have the adjoint and also the determinant. All right, so the adjoint is easy. 
we have the adjoint of t is equal to interchange your leading diagonal so you're going to have zero on top and then the two below and then the non-leading you change the signs on the non-leading so this negative one turn positive and this two will turn negative so negative two down here and positive one up here that's your adjoint now the determinant of t can write it like this will be the product of the leading which is two by zero take away the product of the non-leading which is two by negative one Now 2 by 0 is 0, and this 2 by negative 1, and this negative sign, well, this negative sign and this negative sign, let's get a plus sign, right? So you come like I say, negative 2 multiplied by negative 1, which will just be positive 2. So your determinant is just positive 2. So now t inverse would be 1 over the determinant of t multiplied by the adjoint of t. And that's why you're getting inverse. All right, so 1 over the determinant of t is 1 over 2 times the adjoint, which is the 0, negative 2, 1, 2. Now, normally I would leave the inverse like this, but because we want the transformation matrix, I'll actually go and multiply and do this out. So a half by 0 is just 0. So this is 0. A half by negative 2 is just negative 1. A half by 1 is a half. And a half by this 2 here is just 1. And now this is t inverse. So this t inverse maps the image A prime to the object A. Alright, so t inverse maps A prime to A. So now moving on to part 3. We have another transformation, P is defined by the matrix, and we have the transformation matrix of P. They want to find a single 2 by 2 matrix that represents the combined transformation of T followed by P. So here I have T on top here, and so this is my transformation matrix for T, and this is my transformation matrix for P. Now, once you say T followed by P, I know you'll be tempted to put T first and then P. Now what we have to do is multiply these two matrices, these two transformation matrices, and it's going to go in the reverse order. So we're actually going to multiply the transformation matrix P by the transformation matrix T to get the single transformation matrix for T followed by P. So just like the reverse. Alright, so the answer to this question is the transformation matrix P multiplied by T. So you're going to have 0, 1, 1, negative 2 multiply by 2, 2, negative 1, 0. All right, so to multiply this, you're going to multiply rows in the first matrix by columns in the second matrix. So we'll have for, our, well, our answer is going to be a 2 by 2 matrix because this is a 2 by 2 multiplied by 2 by 2. The answer is going to be a 2 by 2 matrix. So our first number will be in our first row, first column. I'll show you what I mean. So our answer will be a 2 by 2 matrix like this. You'll have a number here, a number here, a number here, and a number here. Now this first number here is in the first row, first column. That's why I had to multiply the first row by the first column to get this number here. Alright, so 0 by 2 plus 1 by 2. So that's 0 by 2, which is just 0, plus 1 by 2, which is just 2. Now if you want to get a number below here, this number here, this is in your second row but your first column so you multiply your second row by your first column to get the number below here so 1 by 2 is 2 and then you have negative 2 by 2 which is negative 4 so plus negative 4 now I can write the plus negative 4 but I know it's going to be 2 take away 4 so I can write that one time All right so let's take away 4 now if you want the number for here this is in your first row second column that's the number up top here. So the number going on top here is in your first row, second column. So you multiply your first row by your second column. So 0 by negative 1 is 0, plus 1 by 0 is 0. Now the last one is the number down here, which is in your second row and your second column. So you're going to multiply your second row by your second column. So 1 by negative 1 is negative 1, plus negative 2 by 0, which is just 0. So that'll be equal to 0 plus 2 is 2, 2 take away 4 is negative 2, this is just 0, and negative 1 plus 0 is just negative 1. 
and this would be for your transformation matrix, your single transformation matrix of T followed by P. Now for part B of this part three, we wanna hence find the image of the point one four, so this is our object, under this combined transformation. So this is the combined transformation here. So what we wanna do is multiply this PT, which is two, negative two, zero, negative one, by this object coordinate, I'm writing this as a column matrix, so that'll be one first, then the four, and that will give you an image coordinate here. So again, we want rows in the first matrix by columns in the second matrix. Now this here is a two by two matrix, so it's two rows, two columns. And now this matrix here has two rows, but one column, so it's a two by one matrix. Therefore, answer is gonna be on the outer ends, or answer is gonna be a two by one matrix. So since we know our answer is gonna be a two by one matrix, we're gonna get a number here and a number here. So it'll be a two by one matrix just like this. So if you want the first number that's supposed to go on top here, this is in your first row, first column. So you multiply our first row by our first column here. So two by one is two, plus zero by four is zero. And the number down here is in your second row, first column. That's why we multiply our second row here by our first column here. So negative two by one is negative two, plus negative one by four is negative four. So I could simply write negative four here. So now this will be equal to, well, two plus zero is two, and this you're gonna add and keep the negative sign, so negative six. So the image coordinates is two comma negative six. So now moving on to part B, which is the vectors part of the question, we have the diagram below, not drawn to scale, shows a quadrilateral ABCD in which the vector AB is equal to M, the vector DC is three times M, and the vector AD is equal to N. Now the same here to complete the statement below on the geometric properties of the following vectors. So we have vector AB and vector DC are. Now if AB is M and D to C is three times M, you know once one vector is a multiple of the other vector, then the vectors are parallel. Therefore, AB and DC are parallel. So my answer for here is parallel. Now here we have the magnitude of AB is something times the magnitude of CD. So these two strokes on either side of the vector means magnitude of the vector, which is the length of the line. So we're looking at the length of the line AB and the length of the line DC. Now, whatever the x and y components of the vector m, we don't know. But we know that AB is m and DC is 3 times m, which means DC is 3 times the vector AB. So also the magnitude of DC will be 3 times the vector AB. Now, they didn't have it as the magnitude of CD is equal to what times the vector AB. They have AB first. So now, that's, that's common sense. Um, if DC is three times AB, then AB is just one third of DC. All right, so AB is one third times CD. Well, the magnitude of AB is one third times the magnitude of CD. Now here for part two of the question, we want to express BC in terms of M and N. Now that's putting the arrow for BC, so you're going from B to C. So this is the vector that we want. Now I'm trying to use the triangle lower here, but I'm not seeing anywhere that I can make a triangle here that would relate to M and N. But if I were to make a triangle from D to B, let's do that. So from D to B like this, then this vector would relate to N and M. I will also form a triangle with this here so I could get the BC in terms of M and N. Now, you know, if this is my resultant vector, let's see how we want this for here. If this is my resultant vector, I want the tail of this resultant to touch the tail of this vector. So I want this vector to go like this. All right, so BC would be BD plus DC. So I'll write that BC will be equal to BD 
plus DC. Now I have DC, but I don't have BD. That is one in green here. So I'll have to find this vector. So now this is my resultant vector. Therefore, I need the head. This the head is on this side here. So this is good. This, this head is touching this head. So this is good. So what I want is for a tail of this resultant vector, this tail to touch this tail. So therefore, this has to switch around. All right. So therefore, we want negative M plus N will be equal to BD. All right. So let's highlight the part that I want. So this is already N going in this direction. But what I want is for this vector to go in this direction. And this will be negative M. So what I'll have is negative M plus N is B to D. So I'm going to write B to D is equal to BA plus AD. BA plus AD, which is B to A will be negative M plus AD, which is N. Now if I could write this the other way around, um, N take away M, or I can leave it like this. All right, so that's BD. So now we could find BC which is my BD plus my DC. And BD we found that as N take away M. So that's N take away M plus, and DC is what? DC is this down here, which is just 3M. So now we have all like terms already together. So negative M, which is negative 1M, plus 3M is this positive 2M. So we have N plus 2M. And this is my vector BC. Now, if you don't understand the triangles, you can look at the simple concept. Notice that if I wanted BC, I have the B on this end and it's ending with the C. So they're on the ends of B and C and in the middle have the same letter. So you can try and make that pattern work for you. Um, if I want BD, notice I have B on this end and D on this next end and in the middle I have the same letter, which is A. So what you could do, you could say I want BC, put B on one end, C on this end, and for the middle, Try to see which um, point a vector with B has with a vector with C. So if I look to say, okay, a vector with B and a vector with C, what point do they have in common? That would be D. So I know D going in the middle. And that's how I'm able to get um, BC. All right? So now I know, and from finding BC, I know I have to get BD. So I write BD. I put the B here, I put the D here. So I know a vector with B and a vector with D have to have something in common. So I look for B. And I look for D and I ask, what does these two have in common? What point will they have in common? A vector containing these two will have in common. And you can see that as C. But if I use C, I still don't know the vector BC that I was trying to find. So that why using BC and CD would not work. So I come here now. They have the point A in common. A vector with B and a vector with D would have this point A in common. And that's why this would work. Because I, I know what is this. This AD and I know what is the... Um, well, A to B was M, and let's reverse it as negative M. So that's why we went with this part here. So you can look at it like that if you don't understand the triangle law. Now for part three of the question, we have L is the midpoint of CD. So we have C to D here, and L is the midpoint. Oh, so look L here. All right, so find BL in terms of M and N. So that's B to L. Let's draw that line from B to L. And the vector will be going this direction, B to L. Now, I'd just like to recall that BC was equal to N plus 2M. So that's N plus 2M. So if you're looking at this triangle here, and this is my result on vector, this is the tail of the vector. So this tail, this vector, the tail must connect the tail. Therefore, this vector has to go in this direction. Okay, and therefore this vector, the head must connect to this head. So it has to go in this direction. Now the fact that it tells me that L is the midpoint of DC, it means from D to L is a half 3M and from L to C is a half 3M. So I'm going to put DL is equal to a half 3M, right, which simply means 3 over 2m. That's the vector dl. And that would also imply that, you know, the vector l to c is also 3 over 2m. 
Now, seeing that I want the arrow to go in this direction, which is now, you see this L to C, L to C going this way, but I go in the opposite direction. So that would imply that C to L is just going to be the negative of this, which is negative 3 over 2 M. So now when I write the vector BL is equal to, again, if you want to go to the um, concept, you put B here. L here, put a plus sign in the middle, and I want to see what, what both of them have in common. Well, a vector with B and a vector at L, if I look at the triangle, we only have the point C in common, therefore C goes here and here. So that's C, C, put a vector, arrow. But if you look at a triangle, though, this is my resultant vector. This forms my triangle here. And since this is the result on this is the tail, so the tail of this vector must connect to the tail of this one. That's why the arrow to go this way. And since the head is coming here, the head of this vector must connect to the head here. So that's why the arrow is going this way. So you can see BC plus CL will be equal to the vector BL. Now we already have BC as this n plus 2m. And now we have the vector C to L as negative 3 over 2m. So we're going to have BC, which is n plus 2m plus CL, which is negative 3 over 2M. So we're going to have N plus 2M take away 3 over 2M. So we can just work this out on the calculator. This is just really 2 take away 3 over 2. So we can just type in 2 take away 3 over 2. And we get a half. So that'll just be a half M. So we're going to have N plus a half m and that's my vector bl and that will bring us to the end of this video and the end of this class paper